introduction and then a little question. So there's nothing formal tonight. So. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. And so clearly we're in a spirited conversation, which uh, I'm happy to have. Uh, so I'll give you guys a little bit of background about myself, and then I'm going to give you the, the high-level high overview of uh, my take on transportation in Seattle, just recognizing that I've been here five, six weeks now, so I clearly don't know everything there is to know about this, so I'm, I'm starting to get some impressions of it. Uh, favorable, I might add. <laughs> uh, I really have enjoyed my time here. So I just moved here from the city of Chicago. Uh, when I was there, I... My most recent job was I was running a company, a company that uh, operates bike sharing in New York, Chicago, D.C., Boston, Toronto, Melbourne, and a couple of Chattanooga and Columbus, and uh, soon to be Seattle. Uh, before that, I was the managing deputy commissioner at the Chicago Department of Transportation, and so there I managed our uh, project development and planning group, and then our traffic safety and traffic engineering group. Uh, before that, I was at the District of Columbia Department of Transportation uh, and the Washington Metro. And when I was at DC, at the DC DOT DOT, I managed our transit group. So we had a, uh, a small transit service we provided. We also were planning and building the streetcar system and uh, had a bike share system, managed the public space for car sharing, and then managed or provided support to uh, the regional transit authority to model to provide you know, bus improvements and then also uh, we purchased service from WMATA in, in much the same way that uh, you know, Seattle was proposing to purchase service from King County Metro. So that's a little bit of background uh, of where I am or who I am and where I'm from. Uh, in terms of transportation in Seattle, uh, I think at a high level, every DOT, the first priority is always going to be safety. And I think here in Seattle, Seattle is a safe city to travel in, but at the same time, you know, we've had uh, three fatalities of, uh, in the last five weeks. Uh, two in my first week, and both visible from my office. And uh, we've had a number of serious crashes. All, two involving motorcycles, but the rest involving uh, bicycles and pedestrians. And so, you know, a lot of where I come from in transportation is wanting to make sure that we protect the most vulnerable users of the roadway and the streets. So, everybody's <coughs> a pedestrian at one point or another in their trip, whether, whether they're walking from their house to a bus stop or just walking through their whole trip or even walking from a parked car. They're still a pedestrian and they are the most vulnerable. So we need to make sure that they're safe. I also think that uh, you know the city is growing tremendously quickly. It's the fastest growing big city in the country, and uh, it actually reminds me a lot of DC in that regard. Very similar sizes, similar growth rates, uh, and that's a great thing for the city. It brings a lot of benefits. And it makes for more vibrant commercial activity in our neighborhoods. Uh, allows us to have more walkable communities, which I think, you know, if you're living in a, in a big city, that's part of what, at least for me, I'm able to live in Seattle, is that I can walk to a lot of places, I can walk to work every day. Uh, but it's not without its challenges, so it stresses the transportation system. And so what we need to do is figure out how we can use that more efficiently, or how we can make our transportation system work more efficiently. And so, to me, what that means is giving people choices in how they get around the city. Uh, if you look at research into happiness, people that walk to work are the happiest people. Uh, it's just that it's the data in the lot. Happy got me, right? Uh, you get endorphins flowing. The, the signs, we do have signs here that say cross, walk. <laughs> but you never walk cross. Uh, so, the second happiest is biking, third is uh, people that travel by train, fourth is cars, and fifth is buses. And so, you know, I view part of the challenge is how do we make bus travel uh, a little bit better? So, <laughs> better it's, not, it's not the last thing. Uh, Louis C.K., I just like, this is something that is uh, on my mind. I'm not going to do any, I'm not going to do his routine. Uh, it's definitely not safe for work especially with the camera filming. <laughs> but uh, he does a routine 
scene in which he sort of talks about the way people uh, behave when they're in a car. And I think the same is actually true for however you get around, right? But more in a car. Uh, people act in a way that's extremely aggressively. And not yell things at people, say things to people, engage in behavior that if I was sitting next to Bill board right now, I would never say to him <laughs> because it would be completely over the top and inappropriate and angry. But I might mean, say, I mean, I mean, I mean, say it to Bill in a meeting. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, we feel safe saying that in a car. <clears throat> somehow having the windows up makes that okay. And I think a lot of what that boils down to is not having, not having a choice. Right? So a lot of people have to drive places. And so, I think when you give people really good choices in how they get around, they're going to choose modes that make them happier. And so I view it as our job as a team to, do, to provide those options, recognizing that everybody and most people at one point or another are going to have to drive for one reason or another. There's not, it's, it's very rare that you, you, you can do everything in a car. There are some people in some neighborhoods that have that luxury and a lot of us don't. And You know, that's okay, and I, but what I think we need to do is if we, if we allow people the opportunity to walk in a bike and to transit in a good way, that way when you do have to drive, it's a little easier to get around because people are using the road a little more efficiently. When you look at D.C., they've added 75,000 residents over the last 15 years or so, and the number of cars in the city has dropped by 3,000. And so that's a direct result of investing different choices for transportation, whether it's more bus service or expanding uh, transit capacity for metro rail, buying rail cars, that sort of thing, or launching things like bike sharing, which is a real transit system. In D.C. Uh, in Chicago, we're carrying about 15 to 20,000 people a day on the bike sharing system. Right? So that's a, that's a real, that would be the busiest bus line in Seattle as a, as a point of perspective. So it, you know, it's a real transit system. There's car sharing uh, as well. So if you have a car to go, you, know, you can you can you know take a trip that you know maybe doesn't get met by the bus network, but it allows you to live. Uh, maybe instead of having two cars in your house, then you have one. Maybe instead of having one, you have zero. So investing in these things gives us choices, and I think that's really important. I think choice when you think about uh, you know government versus why, why do people get frustrated with government services? I think a lot of it goes down to choice. Uh, it's kind of a trite thing, a trite little saying that I, I have, but you know, if you are unhappy with your phone carrier, like say you have Sprint, you can switch to AT&T. But if you are unhappy with your government, right, you get to move. And I think that kind of powerlessness, that lack of choice makes people Feel frustrated, and that's why customer service is so important. So then, you know, I think the third leg of the school is uh, just getting the basics done, right? So when somebody calls and there's a topic, we fill it quickly. When there's a tree that needs to be trimmed, we trim the tree. And when a road needs to be repaved, we figure out how to paint that road. And we do it quickly, and we do it well. And so, at a high level, that's really uh, what I view my charge as. I think the mayor has been. Uh, is really forward thinking on transportation. And he, I think, recognizes also that, you know, too much we've been caught in, you know, sort of these mode wars of it's us versus them. You know, it's bikes versus cars, or pedestrians versus bikes, or, you know, freight versus transit, or whatever it may be. And the reality is, is nobody gets around using all one mode, right? And so instead of thinking about us versus them, we just need a system that all works together so that, you know, it's not going to work perfectly for everybody at the time, but it works well for everybody as much as we can. So with that, I'll, I'll stop, open up the floor for any questions you guys might have. If they're really specific, I may ask Bill to jump in, or I may punt and say I don't know. But if they're, you know, but I'll try to answer as many questions as you can. Uh, if you have questions, raise your hand and I'll say, okay, Diane. Hi, Scott. Good to see uh, you again. You too. Good to be last week. Yeah. After you left,
told that there would be this computer chip or something in the buses that would prioritize the bus to go through the intersection. And I usually get on the bus at that triangle across from Trader Joe's, and the bus sits there at that intersection two years. We don't have the prioritization happening yet on the buses. I don't know if it's an SDOT thing or Metro thing, but I'd like to know when that's going to finally yeah. happen. You don't know the answer, but you may know the answer. Does Chris know the answer? Somebody in this room knows the answer. So it's called transit signal priority. Yeah. And uh, there was, uh, I can't remember the exact number, but it was between 20 and 30 uh, intersections on the C line where there was transit signal priority. And uh, uh, most of those uh, uh, are operational. Um, SDOT installed the transit. Uh, signal priority as part of the city's commitment to uh, improve the speed and reliability of the rapid ride line. Uh, most of those work pretty well. Some of them uh, were more difficult because they required fiber optic. And um, like most mechanical systems, some of them uh, break down from time to time. So if you do notice that um, they are not working, let SDOT know or let Metro know. One of the last ones uh, we can, Bill and I will, yeah, we'll just look it Bill and I will be happy to look into it, but, um, but basically most of them work very well, you know, and, uh, but they do require some fire rock and they do require a lot of mechanical work. Thanks, Dad. Chaz, I did drive by 35th Street today, so I didn't stop. Mm. So, um, Chaz, yes, I mean, you know, they had put some Um, there's been a little bit of discussion uh, within within this group and uh, I think around town about better communications within <coughs> uh, both to internal staff to recognize and prioritize events and to customers that are populous uh, to broadcast what could be critical information, very specific information. Uh, there are a number of municipalities uh, locally that are using mass notification notification systems in my state and USA and a couple others uh, to perform these communications out to the public at large and if they're using it well then also with their internal teams. Mm -hmm. um, is that something that ESTA would be willing to look at or implement or partner with the rest of the city of Seattle in order to, to leverage? Uh, absolutely something to look into. I think you know that's something that I've heard you know from a lot of different folks is communication and you know, that means different things to different people. Sure. Right? But I think that's absolutely something that we can do. Okay. Pete and Linda. Hi. Uh, thank you for coming. It's coming. My pleasure. I just wanted to uh, make a somewhat cynical comment about <laughs> the, I, I would, the people <laughs> that are happy with this. He's perfect. Uh, there's, there's probably a great number of people for whom happiness means doing 45 or 50 down 35th bother on your phone. Yeah. <laughs> and that there is, there is, I just, just watch them. Just stand on an intersection at, somewhere off, not, not in signalized. Just watch them go past mm -hmm. and see how many of them are doing not only exceeding the limit, but they're on the phone or they're doing something down here. Yeah. I don't know what that is, that little god of the palm, but they're they're praying to it, and they have no idea what's going on around them. And that I think comes into when you folks are doing your work, you have to consider that. Yeah. And 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 it, you know, it's it's a really good point. So let me I want to I want to address that. <coughs> I give very answers to the Uh. You know, I think there's a habit of moving, like what I call distracted moving, right? So whether you're, you know, walking and talking on a cell phone and looking at your phone or driving, people are just distracted all the time. I was going to meet with Councilmember Rasmussen one morning uh, last Saturday or a couple Saturdays ago, and I was walking down the sidewalk and I was looking at my phone, and I was passing by a new core steel. And, you know, I saw just, for whatever reason, at the corner of my eye, I saw it was a driveway, and I just popped out my head from the phone, right? And right as 
as I pop up my head, I see a semi pulling up, right, with full of steel, like a big 18-wheeler. And he's looking for cars, right, because if you know the area, there's probably not too many pedestrians that he's looking out for, right, because there's no sidewalk, continuous drive, sidewalk, on that side of the street. And so he wasn't looking for me, right? So uh, if I hadn't looked up for my phone, I'd probably would have run over. And, and then at that point, it's, you know, whose fault would it have been? Would it have been his because he wasn't looking for me? Would it have been mine because I was looking at my phone? I, I would imagine that would be somebody else's problem to figure out who was responsible at that point. But, uh, you know, I think, you know, I was in a meeting last night and somebody was talking about, you know, cycles, right? And how, you know, they're not riding safely and looking around cars and things like that. Yeah, sure, that's, that's absolutely true. But at the end of the day, you know, does it, we all need to move around responsibly. It's, it's almost like when you were, uh, you know, getting your driver's license for the first time and people taught you to drive defensively. I think we just need to sort of move defensively and just make sure be responsible for ourselves and then also assume that we need to be a little bit responsible for other people. You know, a lot of the, a lot of the project or every project we do, safety is sort of the number one thing that we do. So in Chicago, uh, we had a we had a street that runs parallel to the Skyway. And the Chicago Skyway is a toll road uh, expressway. And running right next to it is South Chicago Avenue and it was an 80 foot plus wide right of way. Two travel lanes and a center turn lane. Big, wide lanes running parallel to a total road that was linked to an industrial park. And so what you would get is big semis pulling off of the tollway and just cruising down this neighborhood street at you know, 40, our 85th percentile speed was 45 miles an hour on a 30 mile per hour roadway because it was designed, this, it may have been signed for but it was designed for much faster, right? And so we went in and we put in bike lanes and a big wide turn lane. And the neighborhood was just apoplectic. We were like, there's nobody biking down here. Why are you putting a bike lane down here? And we're like, yeah, there's, you're right. There's nobody biking. There's one bike a day. That's it. We're not doing it as a bike project. We're doing it as a safety project. And we need to use up that right of way in some manner, right? Because there's 6,000 cars a day going down this road. There's plenty of capacity. They just happen to be semis moving very, very quickly. And we've had a nursing home across from a CVS and somebody had been killed trying to cross this the street. Have you met 35th? Yeah, so I was coming down here. Uh, to, you know, I don't want to, I don't know what the traffic counts are. We call it I-35. Well, yeah. yeah. Well, to kind of lead into that. But yeah, so I think like, safety is a part of the project. So that's a really long story to say. You know, sometimes you'll see, you know, things that look like they don't make any sense, but really what you're doing is you're just trying to make um, Your punchline was that it worked. It worked. Yeah. It, it yeah. cut down the speeding way, way down. And and a couple months later, you know, the the alderman, which is the council member there, came back to us and said, you know what, I was wrong. It was great. The community loves it. Okay, so I'm going to jump in and just tag on the 35th uh, question, or I 35, or the And I just also uh, want to welcome you, you and remind you that Chicago doesn't have any. We have. Neither does DC. Um, so DC has some hills. Not like we do. Not, they do not yeah, have not like At least not in the We also live, yeah. DC is also a swamp. So it's like when you <laughs> when you lose in hills, you make up in heat. Yeah, yeah. 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 So there is a uh, uh, one question is uh, I 35, the 35th mm. Avenue Southwest, has mm. been slated or ta uh, tasked for a study to be adding those safety improvements and look into whether it's road dive, except you're not supposed to say that, road lane reconfiguration, whether it's um, uh, different things along the length. One of the questions is, uh, what's the funding, it all, of course, it hinges on funding, and the timing of uh, the 35th Avenue study and the options for getting it extended to at least 106th Avenue Southwest to the south. Mm -hmm. um, so might you have that answer? I, I don't necessarily have the funding. I, I mean, just on the word road, I don't know why. But I mean, it, that may be a bad word here, so I cannot be supposed to use it. It, it works. But, uh, <laughs> 
you know, for a lot of, you know, depending on the, depending on the, uh, the, the conditions on the roadway, on the street, sometimes it actually makes it work better. Right? Yeah. Uh, we had that demonstrated successfully in West Yale. So, uh, I don't know what the timing on it. I think the current study is supposed to be completed by the end of the year or some maybe in the next month or so. And it has funding. For the study. For the study. Yeah. Yeah, the right time was this. <coughs>
you know, if we're repaving the street, that's the perfect time to look at where does it fall on the bike master plan, and is it a priority, and is it a dangerous spot, and should we just sort of say, what can we do right now to make sure that we're putting improvements there when it's fresh asphalt? Uh, that way, kind of two things. One is the incremental cost of making the bike improvement. It's pretty low. The other thing is you're not going back and doing work and then coming out and doing the rework a couple years later. You're sort of trying to do it as, as efficiently as you can. So, you know, I've got somebody on my staff, a guy named John Laser, who's looking at what's our 15 and 16 paving program look like and how does that match up against the you know, bike uh, master plan and then having that funnel into the implementation plan. I'm just going to add one quick thing on that, and then I'll come back to Michael. Um, Roxbury Street, over okay. here, uh -huh. south of Roxbury. Uh, it's been part of the study as a three, we've got a couple mm -hmm. community groups all the way up and down, and we have some options. And Roxbury will be part of the bike master plan. Mm -hmm. It is part of the bike master plan, and it is scheduled for some repaving and mm -hmm. road diet work. So I would like to see Roxbury be pushed a little mm -hmm. bit with this bike thing like you're talking about. As far as the efficiency of it, if you're already going to be putting in new asphalt, you know, we, we could use the bike lanes on Roxbury mm -hmm. for that connection. So, that cool. Yeah, so we can look at it. I appreciate yeah, that. For sure. Thank you. Michael? Um, <clears throat> I'm not so sure I have a concrete question. Okay. Maybe <laughs> putting a, a, you know, a little dot sticker uh -huh. up, up on the board uh, for an issue that I'm sure you're aware of or, or highlighting something that we've kind of been bringing up repeatedly. Um, over the course of this year. Um, you know, <clears throat> as you are aware, the West Seattle Bridge is probably the, the busiest corridor in the city that's actually controlled by the city mm -hmm. um, and is one of a very limited number of connections mm -hmm. to our peninsula here. Um, we've been repeatedly bringing up concerns that we feel like there's not really a very clear uh, plan Mm -hmm. or how the city handles emergency situations, crisis situations mm -hmm. that happen, um, uh, that affect mm -hmm. access to that vital corridor. I think we're, we're looking at maybe four or five incidents now that have happened so far this year that have shut down access to the West Seattle Bridge in one way or another, mm -hmm. which affects tens of thousands of people mm -hmm. trying to get on and off of the uh, of our peninsula. So I just want to sort of, as I said, kind of just highlight and bring that up again that, you know, that that's something that we see as a priority is really being really clear what happens when something affects that. What is, you know, what is the clear chain of command who is making these t the decisions for when things get shut down and when they get reopened um, and what are some of the backup ways to sure. notify people what's going on or to take into account that when we as an example of something that happened when we need to shut down the viaduct for very specific emergency reasons. Um, are there ways to maintain access through that corridor um, that make it clear that that access is going only in one direction or only on one side rather than shutting down an entire roadway? Yeah. No, I think it's a, it's a really good point. One of the things uh, I, we sat down with the chief of police this morning or this afternoon rather to talk about how we're dealing with safety going forward. Uh, we're sitting down again Wednesday meeting with the command staff. Uh, I think it's Monday actually. Yeah. Monday to sit down with the command staff and we're going to start having uh, monthly meetings between our senior staff so that we can make sure that we deal with these kinds of issues. If I just add to that, I mean, I think the fact that we have a new director, last talk director, and you know, this chief at the same time is really a great opportunity. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, there were incidents even this year where we, I mean, the chain of command is SPD makes a decision, makes a decision to close the facility if there's an investigation that needs to do. They weren't, it, it, it got to a point where we would try to contact them to, to have some influence on like, how they close, they did, they did, those closings that we would call them by and by and by and so, <laughs> so, so what I would say, I would caution Bill <laughs> that sort of like when you're in the family, you don't fight publicly. I would just say, I'm really excited to work with the 
Well, I would, I would she's just amazing. Add, you know, and I get, hold, on, hold on just one second. And I can tell you, so, you know, the June 10th incident on SR-99, acutely aware of it. It was six weeks before I moved here, and I can tell you exactly how acutely aware of that I am. <laughs> uh, how much I've pounded folks about how we're going to respond to that uh, going forward. Was it that the day of the single car accident shut down the state? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I would add as one additional example, which you know, Chris is certainly well aware of. Metro heard for quite a while from a number of folks about communications when things are going. Um, and Metro has taken great strides so that I can be sitting at work not paying any attention to news and all of a sudden get a text on my phone go, oh, the viaduct has been shut down and buses are being routed. Mm -hmm. Or the 120 is being rerouted on Delridge because of an incident in the low and maybe there's a fire or something. I don't know. Doesn't matter. I know just from my phone or Twitter. So let me tell you something. So I think things are, are changing. I think they've already changed. I think they're going to keep changing. I think they're going to keep getting better. So this morning we had a crash in SR99 in the Pulver Street Tunnel. And mm -hmm. I got a text at 4 in the morning or 3 in the morning from somebody on my staff. Mm -hmm. And we put out a press release, uh, travel advisory, I think by about 4.30. So, that's great. Yeah, so we're, my pleasure. So, I mean, you know, I got to tell you, like, I, I, the, one of the things about DOT is that I think, you know, we as a DOT have spent a lot of time building big capital projects, and I think that is absolutely an essential part of the DOT, but I think that the operational side is just as important. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we have a TMC that, you know, we're going from traffic management center that was open mainly during business hours, it was about 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. Yeah. to, you know, keeping it open 16 hours a day. And that was five days a week, keeping it open fully staffed 16 hours a day, and then staffed with our 24-hour dispatch uh, crews uh, the rest of the time. Because you had 15 there in December. Oh, uh, yeah. We won't give you all that. Right? I'm, I'm aware of that as well. We won't harass I've got you. a lot of history lessons. <laughs> This is a huge, it's a huge deal for the mayor today. It's really taking it very seriously, and I think that's why you heard it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we were um, very instrumental in the uprising of that. So, uh, yeah. It's like the, uh, the, the Whiskey Rebellion of 2014. You know, we, uh, we like to call ourselves that over here in West Seattle. Yeah. Yeah, we're 100,000 strong, and we get angry real fast. Okay. <laughs> that's good to Right? Okay, I'm down to two Hope issues. So. Okay. Two issues, all right. Oh, great. One Go ahead. I moved here about a year ago, and I'm appalled by the state of good repair of the streets. Mm -hmm. I, in, in neighborhoods, once or a couple times on a block, these squares are caving in in the center, mm -hmm. indicating there's some washout in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And it's prevalent all over the city, I think. I've seen it over and over the years. So do you even see click fix or anything like that? What do you do? You have an app for it. Fix it. Yeah. We do. Okay. So what I'd be really curious, we need to look at stuff like this because, you know, in a lot of cities, when I, I'm not, you know, saying anything about what it is here or what it's not, but a lot of times, you know, if, if utilities are coming in or people are coming in and making cuts in the street, you know, you know maybe it's just repairing where it was cut. There's something you see where pavement is, pavement is starting to cave in. Uh, <laughs> let me know. Go ahead. Okay. I'm not sure what you're talking about. Yeah, there was a smartphone that called Fix It, which then signed up right away to give a response from the city with the GPS. It tells you where it is. Find it. Find it. Find it. Find it. Find it. Find it. Okay, I want to take off my county transportation hat and put on my uh, hat and put on my uh, West Seattle bike commuter hat. And, uh, <laughs> um, they uh, uh, passed out this before you got uh -huh. here, Scott, about the Farmer Way, uh, Way Southwest uh, uh -huh. pro project, which I think is a fabulous project. Mm -hmm. It's an absolutely essential bike corridor through West Seattle because it's flat and it accesses uh, mm -hmm. the junction in a wide geographic area. What I would like to put a plug in for is uh, the way bicycles come into West Seattle, and I encourage you to ride a bike out to West Seattle mm -hmm. sometimes, because it's not only one of the most beautiful rides in, in the city, 
uh, also very instructive. His bikes actually come across the lower level of West Seattle Bridge and run along the bike trail, and then they come up Avalon, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and then they get, go to Fault Line. Right? So I would encourage you to. Uh, it says here you're still looking for funding for this project. Mm -hmm. To encourage the block between on the Avalon between 35th and uh, um, uh, uh, and uh, Fauntleroy as part of that project. It doesn't have a lot of car traffic. It would be easy to build uh, bike uh, bike facilities just like you're building on Fauntleroy, and it would be a much more holistic project if you did that. Okay. I'm talking this little triangle, but if you look at the small map down here, that little triangle between 35th and Fauntleroy there, if you look, if you, I would encourage you to, to consider that uh, little block of Avalon as part of this project. Marking it, denoting Marking it, and, uh, you know, yeah. We'll make sure that, uh, I'll second that one. It's been really a lot of areas for us as well. Oh, hey, for, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> it's the way bicycles ride. Sometimes there's like, I, I like to joke around, there's like low hanging fruit and then there's kind of fruit sitting on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what this is. There's like low hanging fruit on the ground. But it doesn't seem like it's at the top of the tree. Marjorie, did you have another one? I'm good. Oh, it's just two. Marjorie. Hi, Mark Westerman. I'm a board member. My son had a traffic. Actually, I think it was our car broke down for a minute, and uh, that's what delayed my coming here now. I've got to leave for the front of the race. So, community association is on the board that same night meetings we're going to talk about. We're in Gallagher. Anyway, um, uh, we have a couple concerns to, to bring forward, and an invitation to. We want, we're going to do a traffic uh, concerns meeting uh, in a couple of months. We'd like to invite you to get some sort of sense. We haven't set a date yet, but we said we'll send you the information. Um, the uh, concern, concern number one is, is uh, our experience in working with Scott often is uh, uh, either truncated or siloed or um, mm -hmm. things fall through the cracks. And, and uh, in our experience, um, we, we've had delays of uh, up to 10 years mm -hmm. before we find we got that stuff to find the event that uh, they brought the mall and then mm -hmm. come and take care of things. Or uh, as the engineer showed up with a, with a plan for something that didn't work, and it turned out they hadn't talked with any of their parent, their sister, their brother agencies. So what we're encouraging SDOT to do is to break through silos mm -hmm. and and start looking holistically at issues mm -hmm. that will involve other city agencies and county agencies so that uh, once and then get the community input so mm -hmm. we've got a, because the last time well one of those times when they brought the completed plan to us and we said did you get any public input for this they said we sent out the postcards mm -hmm. and we said yeah but did you get any public input so we want to go beyond sending out the postcards and make, making sure that you actually talk to the people mm -hmm. um, in the communities and, and so on. Um, second, we encourage you to work with Metro to figure out how to get the bus lane that runs not only down the West Seattle Bridge, but also in the exit tonight. <coughs> <coughs> and I'm going to be saying that earlier. Okay, good. But, but it's good Sorry. that you reminded him about it. Yeah. So now we're going to It's like now, so now I'm going to ask Bill about it every day. Yes. <laughs>
the stuff of XML squared didn't connect with anything. Um, number two, of course, is <coughs> number three is, is the light rail and four is the slut. Number five is the inner city sad transit. Number six is uh, Amtrak. So um, it's curious to me that we've got all this, all these resources and none of them works with each other. So yeah. that, again, is I'm encouraging you to look yeah. holistically mm -hmm.
migrate back down to West Seattle, but maybe we need to do that. <laughs> um, I do want to mention one thing, sure. and it's a large thing for Dodgers. Um, we have a transit hub mm -hmm. in West Seattle. Did you know? Did you know? <laughs> did, you, did you know that? Wait, wait, wait. Let's see if he knows where it is. Do you know where it is? So the transit hub, in, I mean, I'm still learning the geography of West Seattle, so as near as I can tell. The hint is you wouldn't know it by looking at it because you're so <laughs> impossible. <laughs> Then I probably don't know where it is. What I, what I, what there's, uh, I'm still, I'm still learning of all the intersections and things like that. But yeah, California Admiral is a real uh, big area. You have this Alaska it's Junction north. area, it's which is, you know, I think north of the still. This is Morgan here. This is Morgan. Don't make it. Yeah, please. I'm, I'm not sure right. exactly where you're talking about. I have no doubt there are lots will, of places. I will give you a break. Okay. So, um, when the rapid ride came in two years ago, they decided that they would have everything terminated at Westwood Village. And Westwood Village is on the very southern oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. area of West Seattle. So, I'm just on this the other side. This is like, it's kind of like a strip mall on, what's it's the a, name it's of that mall. street? It's a it's, mall. It's like Don Bart. Okay. Don Bart. Okay. It's a big mall. Okay. They actually have a target. Okay. So basically what happened is this Metro uh, decided, uh, and, and you know, I think they might have talked to the community, although I've been there for seven years and I don't remember mm -hmm. anyone asking us. Um, oh, really? is this the one right Chris? across from the park? Yes. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah.
uh, over 3,000 a day. And, uh, and no. Delridge is the biggest food desert without mm -hmm. a grocery store. Yeah. There's four grocery stores in, in the mall. And so that was part of the driving. Yeah. Of the and I'm really I'm excited. I'm complaining about the, I'm, I'm just complaining about this. But yeah. we can do a better job of coordinating. Right. Uh, you know, I've sat down with Kevin a couple times since I've gotten here, and I, I think he's going to be a great partner to work with. You know, I think that, you know, there's been a couple issues that have come, come up where I think, you know, he was kind of worried that maybe we weren't going to support him as much as we did. And so, you know, we're going to be supporting him. Half the people get to the downtown and getting their bus. Right? And there's a lot of other people all over the city that are getting on the bus as well. To push the and, you know, so we need to do what we can. And that's how we, we want more people to make any other questions? Uh, oh, Todd, Michael, uh, Mike. Yeah, following up on Amanda's comment, I think that I would like to ask you to ask your people to be more proactive and brave. Mm -hmm. I would ask that that's not the work that you suffer in your disease, but you've got some really good, smart people mm -hmm. working for you, and to encourage them to not have to have Amanda come to them and say, this is the it's obvious yeah. they'll take care of it and Amanda doesn't have to get all stressed out. So <laughs> that's, yeah. that, that's what I do then. That, that's the key thing. But my my hardball question is the waterfront. Mm -hmm. uh, the waterfront uh, it's sunk a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And so what are you are you satisfied with the way that the management by this dot now Waterfront project is what we intend to enhance Yeah, I'm happy with where we're at. I think our primary role on the waterfront right now, as special, is in the seawater. Fun time project, and I am happy with where we're at. Uh, it's a really complicated project, and it's sort of dependent on it's, it's, a, it's a very complicated project, primarily from this day, constituent or stakeholder management. And scheduling standpoint, because we've got like, fish on one end and the tourist season on the other that's sort of mm -hmm. driving our ability to work. And what? Sound energy. And sound energy. I mean, there's all sorts of different things, but yeah, I'm happy with where we are on that. On the first one, you know, this is sort of the something that I've asked folks <coughs> in that stuff and start to hey, it's okay to be bold. It's okay to try try things. And if they don't work, let's try it again in a different way. Uh, one thing I will say, though, is that, you know, in a lot of ways, uh, being a transportation planner in a city like Seattle is a little bit, I mean, I, I equate it, and I, I say this with all affection to the uh, community involvement, which I think always leads to a better process, is that it's it's painful for <laughs> the folks that are doing the work, right? You know, because to, to, you know, you're going in and you're saying, like, you know, you're going to make, for every person, you, you know, if you're, if you're going in and you do things right, like, every, you know, you make everything, everybody happy, you know, that's impossible, right? There's 30% of the people in this world are going to argue with sunshine, right? So you're not going to make everybody happy all the time. And, you know, especially when you have a scarce resource, like right away, it's almost like, you know, you've got Thanksgiving dinner, you've got a, a pie sitting there, and suddenly somebody invites an extra guest, and so we're all fine. Uh, and so, uh, what I sort of view my role as for them is providing protection. So again, you guys go out there, you know, uh, make what we think are the best tactical decisions. You know, the best, you know, given what the community is looking for, what the challenges you're facing are, and recognizing that there are going to be times when we get yelled at, and it's okay, or you know, we upset people. Uh, not obviously, you know, we want to make most people happy. People, you know, we don't want to uh, uh, rush out to people at all. But, you know, there, there's nothing that we can do that's going to address the challenge that we have without, you know, having a little bit of attention that we don't get that okay. We are way over on our time.